thank you guys so much for being here and joining us. Um, today is week nine of the summer series, and we are um, we are going to talk about off grid mining. So we have we have we have Marty, um, we have Chase, and we have Steve, and we also have a special guest moderator, our Galaxy Digital intern Geom, who he told me I can only refer to him as Moderator GG today. So, um, Moderator Gigi, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you guys for being here uh, for this uh, for this summer series. Uh, I guess we could start by presenting uh, each and every one of you for the people that might not uh, know you. Uh, so, could you guys give like each a short presentation of your company and uh, your role? Maybe we can start with you, uh, Steve. Okay, um, my name is Steve Barber. I'm the owner and uh, president of Upstream Data Inc. Uh, we're based in Canada. Uh, we do we offer uh, products and services around Bitcoin mining, uh, particularly in the oil field. Um, so yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, my role at the company is you know just as primary owner and do most of the engineering and design and. Uh, and we're about 20, uh, 25, approaching 25 employees right now. Chase, what about you? Sure. Um, thanks for having me on. Sorry, I uh, was showing a little bit late. It's, it's quite early here in San Francisco. Um, I, uh, but my, my name is Chase Lockmiller. I'm the, the CEO and uh, uh, one of the co-founders of Crusoe Energy. Um, you know, we're focused on uh, co-locating data centers um, alongside stranded energy resources. Um, so, you know, uh, flare gas is, is a big focus for us. Um, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, employee count, you know, we're about 80 people. Um, we're focused on, on Bitcoin mining and, and high performance computing. Um, so we have a um, large, uh, you know, scale deployed uh, Bitcoin mining footprint, but we also have a uh, um, sort of incubated uh, uh, high performance computing business that, that offers uh, uh, low cost, uh, you know, access to uh, GPU computing environments for uh, applications like artificial intelligence and uh, graphical rendering. Um, and, uh, you know, we have offices in San Francisco, Denver, Chicago, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, Williston, North Dakota. So, um, that's a little bit about, about Crusoe. Thanks, Chase. And uh, last but definitely not least, uh, Marty. I am uh, Marty Ben. I'm the Director of Business Development at Great American Mining, and similar to what Steve and Chase are doing at Upstream Crusoe. We are a Bitcoin mining company that uh, leverages uh, gas would otherwise be flared as our energy source. Predominantly, uh, most of our Containers are deployed in North Dakota, um, where flaring regulations are pretty strict. Uh, we have a production facility down in Louisiana where we engineer and uh, design and build our containers and electrical engineering systems ourselves. And yeah, so we're very passionate about um, Bitcoin, number one, and then uh, ensuring that they succeed by making sure that hash rate is sufficiently distributed um, uh, with our off-grid model. Um, and just turns out that off-grid too pr presents a, a good economic opportunity as flare gas tends to be pretty cheap. Yeah, thank you guys for that. Uh, so yeah, today we have to talk about like off-grid mining. So I guess before we start, uh, the first question uh, that I want you guys to answer uh, would be, what is according to you guys, the definition of off-grid mining? Because from what I can understand, uh, people have different definitions of off-grid mining, flared gas, vented gas. Uh, could you guys each give like a, your own definition of what off-grid mining stands for? Sure. Um, you know, I think any of us can answer this, but I, uh, and I, I think people have different interpretations. But uh, what what I would qualify off-grid mining as is is mining that is. Uh, uh, mining off of a power source that is that is you know not connected to the grid. So um, in our case, you, you know, in, in the case of flare gas, you know, we co-locate data centers on site with oil and gas facilities, um, and the fuel 
source is is a is a is a gas stream that would otherwise be flared, um, and you know is then utilized to generate power with uh, power generation equipment, um, which you know uh, either uh, reciprocating engines or, or gas turbines um, on site, um, and uh, then that power is used to to power these data centers and uh, you know these these uh, mining operations. Um, uh, you know, I think there's other, you know, great examples of, of off-grid mining uh, and, you know, stranded energy sources that, that we've looked at or, you know, are in early stages of developing um, everything from, uh, you know, wind facilities, uh, you know, that uh, where, where you're, where you're co-locating with a wind facility behind the meter um, or, uh, you know, even all the way to uh, nuclear, nuclear plants that, you know, uh, are, you know, not, you know, you're basically consuming it directly from from the plant behind the meter. So, um, broadly speaking, I would say just anything that's consuming power directly from the power generation source that's not going through a utility, um, I would consider to be off grid mining. I think I think Chase just nailed it. Like, there's nothing nothing more to add for me. Yeah, the one thing I would add is like a term that I really like personally. I think has a good sort of connotation and can help fight the energy FUD is, is labeling this off-grid, these off-grid energy sources as non-rival. So you're not rivaling consumer, uh, like consumers who are using on-grid electricity. You're not, Bitcoin miners aren't actually taking, especially if they're off-grid, they're not taking electricity away from people who need it to, to live their lives. So that, that non-rival definition, I think Nick Carter, May have coined it. Um, I think that's really as a way yeah. to describe what we do. I heard you. I heard you say that, Marty. I, I love that term. I think it's. I think it's really great. I think. I think people just get. Uh, yeah, you know. I think it. It helps. Uh, you know, decouple this. This issue of oh, Bitcoin mining is consuming so much energy, but you know, if it's energy that literally is not, you know, being used or not competing for use for any sort of. Uh, other commercial or uh, residential uh, consumption, I think it's a, a huge net positive, especially when it can be an emission reducing uh, technology like, uh, you know, digital flare mitigation. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that gives us like a good uh, transitions uh, toward like the next question, which is like, um, could you guys like explain to the audience the, the relationship between stranded energy and Bitcoin? Uh, because like, for example, we know that venting uh, is like banned in multiple states in the US and flaring is also like heavily regulated. So could you guys give like give us like a background on on the on this like particular relationship? Yeah, I mean, uh, go, go ahead, Murray. You go ahead, Steve. You're the expert <laughs> in the field in oil and gas. Um, well, I guess, uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, the relationship between Bitcoin and like stranded energy. Well, Bitcoin, uh, I think, you know, uh, maybe the, certainly what struck me as the greatest innovation or property of Bitcoin when I first read about it was that it is a portable, um, demand on energy. So some people like as, as it relates to like oil and gas mining in the oil and gas industry I, I don't know if it was marty's team or somebody coined like digital pipeline uh so that term when i first heard it i really like that um because it's sort of like a virtual uh a bitcoin mine just being a you know uh, as chase described like a natural gas turbine or engine uh a power plant uh feeding computers uh it's portable uh you can bring it right to the energy source so it's sort of a mobile market and uh, a portable demand on that energy so uh, bitcoin mining generally has a really great synergy with uh, stranded energy sources like anything that is not feasible to bring to the market for all kinds of reasons um, usually just infrastructure cost or transmission loss um, and other many other reasons why you know, uh, energy can be stranded. So Bitcoin has a natural that the property of Bitcoin that is digital and you can monetize it uh, on site is really what makes it synergize well with uh, stranded energy. 
And then, yeah, I, I, so I might just add to that a little bit um, on the, uh, you know, I think there's two different types of energy that you can really qualify. You know, there's, there's fuel and then there's actually power, right? So in the case of uh, stranded gas, it's actually, it's a stranded fuel source where it's logistically and economically infeasible to transport that fuel to a downstream market where it can actually be consumed in a traditional sense. And so I think the true innovation that, that Bitcoin mining provides in this sense is that by co-locating the Bitcoin mining facility on site with this stranded fuel source, um, you can actually make use of that fuel. You can, you can bring a beneficial use um, to that fuel because the, tra uh, the transportation of the data associated with, with Bitcoin mining is much easier, cheaper, you know, more feasible um, than, than actually transporting the fuel. Um, I think the, the, a similar thing could be said for uh, stranded power. Um, in the case of, you know, like these wind resources that I mentioned, um, you know, oftentimes uh, the transmission lines of actually moving that power to a place where um, there is a marginal demand for, you know, the next electron that's being generated, um, you know, is it, you know, getting a lot of feedback, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's not, not, not feasible again in that case. And, you know, you, you can again apply this similar uh, technology to, uh, bring a beneficial use to an otherwise not used electron. Uh, all right, so, so um, you guys talked a little bit about like the, the generators, right? The gain sets. So, and we know that like these are very efficient. They can burn like methane uh, up to like 99% efficiency. Uh, could you guys talk about like what is ne the necessary equipment to become like an off-grid miner? And like, also, could you get the, could you guys describe like what you call like a mining container? What are the, what are those like mining containers? Um, yeah, I'll, I, when I when I describe it to people, it's, we get a lot of inquiries on how to how to do this, how to set it up. Um, I usually describe it in, like in buckets of okay, you have well, you have your fuel source, which is natural gas in in this case. Uh, a power plant, so a turbine or a recip engine. So that's the power generation aspect. And then you need the power distribution aspect, which is the, uh, for lack of a better term, the Bitcoin mine or the data center. So that's the infrastructure that's feeding that power to the, you know, the consumer of the power, which is the computers. So those are the, in this case, like Bitcoin mining ASICs. So you got generation, distribution and consumption all in one either single package or in on a single site generally. So that's the gist of it. I, I, I would, I would probably most easily describe. Yeah. Then when it comes down to like specific generation equipment, it really comes down to the, the amount of gas that you're consuming on say the BTU content of the gas and the scale of the operation you're looking to build. Um, so for example, Great American Mining, we have a 700 kilowatt container design. Um, and for that design specifically, we daisy chain a couple of um, a couple of 350 kilowatt generators together, um, actually a few for, for some redundancy, but uh, there's no reason why at scale you can implement something like a turbine um, or something else, and then you can get um, you can get really granular uh, with with smaller gen sets as well, um, but yeah, it really comes down to the scale of your operation on site, the uh, and um, the BTU content of the gas, like how much heat can can certain generators take. That's something you have to take into consideration. Yeah, the the only thing I would add there on the distribution side is is uh, you know typically you need uh, transformers, so it depends on. The power, you know, uh, you know how you're generating your power. Like, uh, you know, what, what, what's what's the voltage of the power you're generating? So, um, you know, we have a two megawatt class of engine that we uh, generate power at, at uh, 480 volts, and you know, we step that down um, to 240, uh, which is what we consume in our our uh, data center. So, there's a big transformer um, for you know our, our turbine project. It's 13.4 kV. Um, so it's a much higher voltage generation capacity and requires a bit more electrical engineering, electrical engineering and uh, electrical infrastructure. So, you know, in that case, it's a, you know, it's a 15 megawatt uh, 
you know, turbine. It's, it's kind of crazy. I mean, it's like a power plant, like just on site. Um, but you know, that's, uh, so there's quite a bit of engineering distribution and a lot of, a lot of cable. I, I think the, uh, you know, the distribution, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, you know that the cable costs are quite expensive. I mean, I mean, you know, with the with the price of uh, uh, copper, you know, we use all copper transformers and, and copper uh, copper cable, copper wire. Um, you know, the the commodity cost of cable is or of copper is just gone through skyrocketing. the skyrocketing. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's really driven up. I think costs across the industry, but uh, uh, you know, that's definitely a, a, a big component. To, um, you know, the, the expense and engineering that, you know, we, we, we have to do in order to deploy a unit on site. Yeah. And I guess that's fine because inflation is transitory, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. It's going away. We just printed a few trillion dollars and it's not going to impact inflation at all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll, so, yeah. I'll make, I'll just may add one last thing, like the transformation he's right. Like when you get into the big power, uh, typically you do have to transform down small power though. Um, you can eliminate that just from configuring the, the power plants direct, but so it, uh, yeah, it does, does change a bit just depending on the scale. All right. And so Chase, you, you talked about like the, some supply chain disruption right now. And uh, we know that there is a huge bottleneck for uh, hosting capacity in North America right now because of the great hash rate migration from China. So do you guys see that as like a massive opportunity for off-grid miners or is it more like a local market for you guys? Um, so we're mostly focused on self-mining. We have uh, one hosting customer. Um, that you know, we just had a really unique partnership with, and uh, we you know we ended up uh, hosting some units for them. I think uh, you know what's what's complicated about off grid mining and sp specifically flare gas mining is that um, uh, you know while the operating expenses are quite a bit lower than I think most other traditional mining solutions. Um, there are uh, a lot more operational complexities associated with it. Um, so, um, you know, one thing people don't discuss that often is that, uh, you know, flare gas resources, they're not, uh, you know, they're not going to be there forever, right? So uh, uh, oil and gas wells have what's called a decline curve where, uh, you know, they're producing uh, oil and gas at a particular site. Um, you know, the amount that they're producing, it's not, uh, it, it tends to decline over the course of time. Um, and this can be particularly bad with, uh, with, with shale wells, um, which is what uh, the, the bulk of the production is in uh, areas like North Dakota and West Texas. Um, and as a result, um, it, it, it sort of causes you to have to uh, relocate units, which is, which is part of the main reason that, you know, we've designed all of our solutions to be very, very mobile um, uh, and, you know, can be packed up and moved in a day. Uh, but what that means is that, you know, there are times when we have to basically mobilize units and, you know, it creates like a full day of downtime um, or potentially more, um, you know, managing that with, with a hosting customer uh, or customers uh, is not something that, you know, we've really wanted to uh, do necessarily it just kind of a, adds an extra complication. That's a bit of a pain in the butt. Um, but uh you know, I, I, I do think there are opportunities, but I think the, uh, you know, essentially, I think the interruptions associated with flare gas mining are more frequent than what you would expect with traditional on-grid mining facilities. Even the ones that curtail for uh, power spikes to get lower power prices, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the China uh, migration, I, I pretty much, I think I'm in sync there with Chase on the hosting. Like um, we do a little bit of hosting over the years. I've done it out of necessity uh, as opposed to like uh, as, as optimal like choice. Necessity meaning like uh, when you host a course, you don't have to outlay the capital for that, for that uh, infrastructure. And it's obviously very capital intensive. So just to grow the business, uh, we've accepted hosting deals just to uh, scale. And uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to provide a service to the oil company. So whether we own that hardware, or if it's hosted uh, and it's some third party, 
the oil company doesn't care uh, depending on the structure of the deal. So uh, I generally like to avoid hosting as well because now you're dealing with another customer uh, and you have to keep them happy as Chase was talking about. If there's any downtime, you know, there's going to be concerns. Um, even if it's written into a contract, there's always going to be some concerns and that's just more stress and overhead on the business. So uh, I don't really view the migration as, I mean, I, th I think there's obviously a big opportunity for North American off-grid to take advantage of that, but I don't know if it's any more of an opportunity than say the rest of the mining industry uh, to take advantage of helping out those uh, stranded ASICs, right? Like the stranded Chinese miners. So at the end of the day, it's just more liquidity on the market in the ASIC industry because um, some of that, some of those, some of that hardware is going to be sold. So it's, uh, I've already noticed like lead times on some of the equipment we order has dropped um, and prices have dropped a little bit, um, but they're already on the rise again with the Bitcoin price. So, uh, but totally, I, I think we're going to see uh, between the three of us here and then there's actually quite a bit of other outfits now doing similar things. Uh, I'm sure uh, there'll be people taking advantage of that uh, migration. And I think one thing for what we do off grid in this containerized containerized solution model that probably isn't really uh, too appeasing for a lot of the miners migrating from China is just scale. I mean, we can scale up to uh, tens of megawatts over the course of a few months, but I think a lot of these Chinese miners, especially the bigger ones, are looking to place like hundreds, like 50 to 200 megawatts of machines at a time, which may not be um, uh, as easy on the off-grid model than it may be uh, behind the grid in a warehouse model. Yep, yep. Uh, Marty, like personally, um... Uh, how are you guys at uh, Great American Mining planning to scale uh, compared like, to publicly traded miners that are obviously much bigger and, and growing? How, how do you guys like uh, are planning to compete against that? Uh, it's on economics, I guess. Uh, we want to drive our all-in cost of power production down as low as possible, so making good relationships with their gen sets providers so we can get the power generation costs down, um, try to make good deals with them, uh, make sure that we're sourcing gas that is cheap so that we can mine profitably um, compared to the rest of the market. And then just scaling, um, scaling with the, uh, the producers that we're working with, just creating good relationships with them, improving that we can, we can reduce their flare consistently and better than any of the other alternatives they have so that they'll put us on more well pads. Um, and beyond that, we have plans um, to go do some private placements and stuff like that on the capital side to help us build out our operations. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it, I guess the gist of it is, is driving our power costs down as low as possible and then owning, um, owning the production stack. Like we, we design everything that goes into our containers from uh, the, the power distribution units, the software that allows us to, to interact with our containers remotely. Um, so we feel like owning that stack and, and being able to drive our costs down internally will help us um, scale our operations. And then just being a good partner with the producers we work with, we find that if they're happy um, with us buying their, their flare gas and, and we're actually considerably helping them reduce their um, flare, then that's, that's a good sort of relationship building activity that allows us to scale with, with uh, producers in the Bakken specifically. Yeah, so, so I, I guess the, the relationship between you and oil and gas producers is like a, a long-term relationship that you, I guess all you guys are pretty like um, interested about. Uh, but um, uh, Chase, for example, I know that like Cruzoe has raised has raised uh, 128 millions uh, recently. Uh, could you talk a bit more about like the the financing landscape? What does it look like for you guys? And in general, like, do investors see the same potential that uh, you see and that I see for off grid mining, or are they completely oblivious about uh, the potential opportunity? 
Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, Marty touched on some of this, but you know, I think our our value proposition is uh, cutting, limiting costs in the mining process by vertically integrating. Um, so we own everything from you know the power production, managing all of the power production, uh, you know, equipment, um, which you know I, I think uh, really helps drive down the cost. Uh, you know, financing that with lower and cheaper costs of capital really you know certainly helps. Um, a lot of these, you know, bigger equipment purchases make more sense to finance with debt than equity. Um, so, uh, you know, if you can drive down those costs of capital, uh, it really helps in your, you know, lifetime cost of energy. Um, but then, you know, we do everything from, uh, you know, managing the, you know, production of the, you know, containers to managing the uh, software to, you know, we actually don't mine through a pool. We, we self mine ourselves directly. We've gotten to a size where, you know, we can sort of manage the variance and, you know, we feel like that's a, a more efficient way to, um, utilize our, our, our capacity, um, and, and take advantage of things like profit switching, um, directly. Um, so all of these things sort of add up to, you know, greater and greater, you know, it's a game of efficiencies and, you know, just, uh, getting each individual, you know, component kind of right. Um, you know, I think there's opportunities in the hardware space as well, which, which we're sort of exploring. Um, but when you look at, you know, publicly traded miners, for instance, you know, I don't think I've seen a single publicly traded miner that has a power price that's, uh, you know, anywhere close to kind of where we're at from, you know, an LCOE. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I think, you know, we view that as our, our primary, you know, long-term competitive advantage between, uh, you know, that and, and vertical integration. So, um, you know, we, we've, uh, and then, you know, as far as scale goes, I think we're, you know, operating, you know, we're, I, I, I don't know, you know, you see kind of different numbers, but I think we're kind of middle of the pack for, uh, you know, what, what's out there on, uh, 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 for, for, for the public miners, as far as size and scale of, of, uh, deployed hash rate. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we recently raised some equity capital. Um, you know, I think there was a leak around, uh, uh, a debt fundraise that we're, we're going through right now. Um, but you know, this is a game of, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, there is a, a lot of capital required to execute on some of these bigger projects, certainly. Um, so, you know, having access to capital markets is, is a big component of, you know, making things work. And I think, you know, certain people have gone the, the public route. Um, you know, we, we kind of, have viewed it as, uh, you know, we, we've, we've been fairly successful navigating capital markets in the private side. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of advantages to being a private company um, that, you know, we, we are enjoying for right now. And, you know, we, you know, we're not really planning to go public um, in the near term, but um, certainly there are, you know, compelling reasons to uh, be public and, you know, be able to raise, you know, uh, uh, equity from, you know, public equity markets. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that, uh, fully answers your question, but, uh, that, that's kind of how we're viewing the world right now. Totally, totally. And, uh, Steve, I guess it's a little bit of the same question for you, uh, personally, for example, on, on Twitter, I always love to see like videos of you guys working, uh, seeing the fields out there. I always think it's like beautiful and super cool. Uh, do people generally like feel the same way for you guys? Like, do you see like a lot of interest for what you guys are trying to build? Yeah, uh, Twitter has been, um, from a business perspective, has been a, a really great thing for us uh, over the years. Bitcoiners generally love what we're all doing, like uh, mainly because, um, well, it's it's sort of you know it's novel and innovative. Uh, the emissions reduction aspect uh, sort of contrast and flies in the face of a lot of the FUD, you know, the environmental damage that Bitcoin is causing. So we're all sort of demonstrating that, you know, mining and the energy, uh, incremental use of energy from Bitcoin mining can actually and is actually uh, not just fundamentally a great thing for the world, but it's it's actually reducing for those that are that care deeply about carbon emissions, it's it's reducing it. So, um, in, in certainly in our cases, uh, as for part of the, 
well, I guess our business in terms of the scaling stuff, uh, I think we're a little bit different, like, cause we don't, and again, it's partly due to, I don't know if you want to call it necessity or just view, but I, I want to build our business as a service business to the oil field. So we're more about sales and sending equipment to people that want it. And we don't like our self mining is pretty minuscule, uh, compared to our total deployments. We end up usually sending it to our customer. Usually we're trying to sell to the oil company direct. A lot of times now, um, uh, especially since the industry is growing so rapidly, uh, we send a lot to, we ship a lot to third parties who end up, you know, doing their own deals with uh, the oil companies. But our goal is to actually work direct with oil companies, just like any oil field service business. So like I, I sometimes equate us, like when people are asking me about my business model, we're like a compress, we're like a compression company. We, we assemble, manufacture the infrastructure, such as like a gas compressor. In this case, it's a gen set and a Bitcoin mine and we sell it to them. And then we provide a service around it. Um, so my goal is to have the oil companies, you know, if it, if we can, uh, keep advancing it and we've slowly been making progress, getting them to self mine, but my goal is to have them self mining. And, uh, cause it's one, it's, it's a, it's a scaling method where we don't need a huge amount of finance, like financing back end. Um, although it, it, it also, uh, it's probably a slower way to scale, but, uh, that's just where we're at with that. Yeah. Yeah. And self mining is a, is a really interesting topic. And uh, so I guess we mentioned the, the energy feud a couple of times and how uh, off-grid mining is like absolutely great to counter this narrative. But I guess something that people uh, talk uh, a little bit less about is the, um, the, the potential impact of off-grid mining for decentralization. In, in the grand scheme of things, having miners that are completely off-grid and removed from any potential I don't know, like government overreach or bad regulation. And I know that most of you guys operate on private property also. Uh, so could you guys talk a little bit about like this, this potential uh, relationship between off-grid mining and decentralization? Uh, I know Marty that you might have like some, some strong feelings about, uh, about this, so yeah. Uh, about ESG specifically? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, look, they, if, my problem with ESG is, is like this amorphous like, virtue signal that you can't really hone in on, uh, really. Like, it, it's, it's companies trying to be churches. I, think, I forget the professor from NYU has said this recently, but ESG is a bunch of companies trying to be churches. And when that happens, they're not good companies or good churches by trying to be the virtuous sort of virtue signal and then the whole ESG movement is an abdication of responsibility all the way from businesses to individuals who don't want to cope with the fact that the quality of life that they've been given uh, comes at a cost of energy production and distribution, which many view as bad, but I would argue is, is an incredible feat of human ingenuity. But when it comes down to uh, ESG as it pertains to Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, what we do, like, yeah, like what we do in the field with this flare gas mining is extremely uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, whether or not it's socially and governance friendly in the future is yet to be seen. Um, if our companies don't act in, in certain ways, the ESG movement can, via the allocation of capital, can try to force us to act in certain ways. So what I really like to, I, I think the ESG movement in and of itself is just a huge distraction that's going to lead to a bunch of misallocation of capital um, because people are, are looking to virtue signal for for brownie points from the public but um, there's no doubt about it what we do in great american mining with chase and steve are doing a crusoe and upstream data is environmentally friendly it's helping us become extremely energy efficient which is is certainly virtuous in action and something that uh, should be lauded and, and uh, applauded, but um, I don't think, I think we're, we're doing this for economic reasons. Uh, predominantly, it helps us drive our cost of power production down lower than a lot of the market and allows us to mine Bitcoin more profitably and uh, 
just a, a product of that is we're we're also helping to reduce emissions and make the global economy more energy efficient, which is a beautiful thing. I think trying to mandate um, things as they pertain to environmentalism, social justice, and corporate governance from a top-down capital allocation structure uh, is is just another form of a planned economy that I don't personally agree with, but we do check the ESG boxes at Great American Mining if, if they exist. I'm sorry if that was like a long spiel. I'm also driving through New York and trying to concentrate on traffic at the same time. No, no it, it was it great. Be easy in yeah. New York, right? Yeah, and so in, in that regard, do you think it's overall like a net positive for decentralization to have like of grid miners oh yeah i mean i think on grid mining is going to be i mean we've already seen it throughout the history of bitcoin it's a huge political risk i think it makes your operations easier to identify uh then you have the um the basically the confrontation with on grid consumers like if their prices go up or you have rolling blackouts even though bitcoin miners per se may not, may not be the direct reason for those increased prices or blackouts they will be the uh, one of the first sort of consumers of that electricity that gets pinpointed as um, somebody that's taking from uh, the constituents of that particular grid and that locality um, and then the containerized model that we have i think it makes uh, Bitcoin extremely more robust because it's just harder harder to kill. You can't identify our operations on grid. Um, they're spread out geographically all over the place. Instead of having 200 megawatts in one warehouse that could be drone attacked, you have uh, tens to hundreds of containers spread out across hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, theoretically. Um, and I think it just makes Bitcoin, uh, from a network perspective, much much harder to kill. Yeah, I, I think the big robustness comes from the fact that, uh, like, I mean, you've seen pushback from utilities and, uh, you know, constituents that are uh, basically, you know, buying power from those utilities. And, you know, you, you sort of saw that in Eastern Washington, um, you know, a few years ago, um, you know, you're, you're seeing this bill, uh, you know, trying to, you saw this bill trying to get past that uh, they were going to, you know, basically ban Bitcoin mining in New York uh, until they, you know, understood it for, you know, three years. Um, so the nice part about off-grid mining is that, you know, you, you're, you're sort of, you don't fall under uh, regulations that apply to utilities. Um, it is still regulated. You know, we are still like paying taxes. We are still, you know, in the oil fields specifically, you're dealing in a very, uh, in a highly regulated environment because you're dealing with, you know, these, uh, you know, volatile compounds. Um, so, you know, all of our, you know, I would say from an electrical standpoint, we're actually more regulated than, um, you know, a, a warehouse mine, for instance. Um, you know, we, we, you know, North Dakota, I think is uh, notorious for, you know, having one of the most stringent uh, electrical inspection processes. And, uh, uh, you know, so everything we do is to, you know, UL standards and National Electric Code standards. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's actually, um, you know, highly regulated, but, you know, the decentralization aspect of it and the robustness against, you know, getting shut off by utilities and whatnot, I think is a, is a huge positive. Yeah. The only thing I'll add, like the, you know, there's, there's geographic decentralization, which, you know, Marty talked about being miles and miles apart. Um, which is one thing uh, and is important. Um, in my mind, the most important thing uh, regarding, say, decentralization and like network robustness against censorship is hash rate ownership distribution. Uh, so that particularly, specifically, I mean, like who owns the ASICs and who's mining with those ASICs? Because of course, we're all, we might all own our own ASICs and mining on a pool, but at the end of the day, we can switch pools. Uh, we can solo mine. It's the owner of the ASIC uh, that is most important, I think, for decentralization. Uh, that doesn't exactly drive, say, our business model to, to distribute ASICs to our customers. It's not the decentralization of it that drives that 
choice, but it is a nice aspect of it because uh, I think we could say that we are doing a lot to decentralize hash rate ownership um, because most of our deployments are with independent customers and owners of that of those ASICs and that infrastructure. We usually set them up like because most of the time they don't know what they're doing. So we set them up on a pool and hold their hand. Um, but at the end of the day, if that pool, uh, say it gets regulated by some oppressive re uh, regulatory uh, rule set, something like something that might come out of New York, for example, and start surveilling that pool and censoring the pool and what it can do to which blocks uh, or which transactions it can allow in the blocks and stuff. Well, at least those owners of the ASICs can say, well, you know, this isn't, this pool's not for me anymore. I'm going to move, I might solo like Chase, Chase's company does solo mining. Or uh, if they're big enough, uh, the, the owner can do that or um, they can find a different pool. So ownership, in my opinion, is always what matters most, uh, whether not exactly in, in jurisdiction. It's nice to be in separate jurisdictions, not all in one jurisdiction where you might have one overarching um, regulatory like regime come in and suppress things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm we, we are still subject to like, you know, at least domestic, you know, anything domestically in the US, we're still going to be subject to, it's not like, uh, you know, if they're going to implement some crazy tax in this infrastructure bill on miners, like, you know, that's still going to apply yeah. to us, right? <laughs> like we're still going to get uh, screwed. Yeah. Up. <laughs> like, yeah, we're all, we're all, all of us here as business owners, basically at the whim of regulation, no matter what it is, we're going to comply. Yeah. yeah. I don't think anybody's trying to like fly by night and, you know, just say, Hey, you know, we're, we're not really doing this, but yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I think there is um, to piggyback on Steve's point too. I mean, I, I think that's the beauty of what we're doing off grid with flare gas specifically. You just have a number of different stakeholders just in the oil and gas industry specifically. I mean, you service anybody from mom and pop, producers who just have a well on their land that they're they're happy to to lease out the operators and um or operate themselves all the way up to super majors and then they're spread out across different basins across different state lines that, that provide different jurisdictional arbitrage opportunities regulatory arbitrage opportunities um and distributing hash rate across those business stakeholders and those state lines i think is very advantageous for the, for the Bitcoin network in the long term. Yeah, and I, I think the the thing Steve's describing, it's a natural evolution to Bitcoin production, right? Is that, uh, you know, large scale energy companies become, you, you know, energy production sort of has this like power law effect. And, you know, particularly in the oil and gas industry, it's, it is highly distributed how uh, oil oil and gas get produced. Um, you know, I think uh, Bitcoin production is probably going to follow some sort of uh, curve that looks very similar to that. You know, people that are controlling energy, you know, in the long term, I think, um, you know, it's, it's only natural for um, them to engage and become large scale Bitcoin producers as well. So I think that's definitely a trend that we're, we're starting to see. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're mostly operating in, you know, a context where we're owning all of the hardware, but increasingly you know, we're having discussions where, you know, uh, operators want to partner with us somehow or uh, set up some sort of joint venture um, where they have some ownership stake in, in that hash rate, which, you know, I think is a net, net positive trend um, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, like, I find it's really interesting, like uh, producers so far when we go out and even our existing customers and new customers, like producers aren't opposed to say, uh, investing in like a gen set, like a power plant. They're not, they're not so opposed to that. They're used to that. Like they, they operate that it's a, they consider it a liquid low risk asset. So, you know, if things went South, um, to them, uh, they know they can reutilize it in their properties. Like they can power a facility, they can sell it, uh, auction it off, whatever. Um, I find that the challenge is getting, uh, them to buy into purchasing ASICs. And that's why, you know, I've whined for years. I, I like whining online and I, I've whined for years about uh, it's just the cost of these machines. If they, the thing that really throttles our business uh, in terms of just the pure sales model is the risk exposure to these machines. And uh, it's a lot of capital. 
if things go south, you can, you can uh, have a lot of problems and they don't, a lot of these companies like these energy producers, they don't, they're not yet ready to uh, consider those machines like a liquid asset that they can easily, uh, uh, you know, liquidate on the market. And then there's all kinds of other things. Like uh, we've had issues with our existing customers coming back later and saying, well, you know what, our insurance companies are now giving us a hassle uh, because the insurance industry has had a bit of a problem for, with cryptocurrency uh, businesses and, and a problem underwriting, underwriting them, which we've experienced ourselves. Uh, so we've actually had customers now um, that were getting into buying their own machines, but then uh, slammed on the brakes because they're like, okay, we're actually risking our insurance uh, relationships right now. That's been a, an interesting uh, development in some of our with some of our customers. And uh, Steve, and, I, feel, I feel like one thing yeah. that can help with that actually is the increased like financialization and you know uh, you know just of the industry and being able to hedge. I mean, when you think yeah. about the way, because uh, you know a lot of EMPs are like overloaded or you know loaded up with debt for uh, drilling capital budgets, and the way they manage that, you know. It's, it's a very similar uh, proposition though, right? It's like you're, you're investing capital upfront to drill holes in the ground and then, you know, relying on a commodity price asset to, you know, flow out of that and then, you know, pay back the, you know, debt capital you invested in and sort of drilling those holes in the ground. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very similar proposition with Bitcoin mining where it's like you're investing, you know, an upfront large sum of money to, buy, you know, purchase these ASICs relying on the future commodity asset production of those ASICs, which in this case is Bitcoin instead of oil. Um, but, uh, you know, in the, in the case of oil, they engage in these like hedging programs to basically, you know, hedge their future, you know, oil risk exposure. I think uh, increasingly you're starting to see, you know, the ability to, you know, do that same thing with, with Bitcoin mining. So you could basically say, uh, you know, you hedge, call it 80% of your you know, future production from the Bitcoin standpoint, then you kind of like can ride some of the upside, but you know, you, you're, uh, you, you're able to kind of limit your downside. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think there's probably something there that's going to, you know, help increase adoption and, you know, uh, increase risk appetite for, for people to go down this path for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, like even like Galaxy, uh, you guys provide financing services around ASICs, right? Like that, that is what a lot of these guys want to see. They want to see the means to like either rent or loan or lease or, or finance uh, the hardware. And I mean, well, like, like Chase said, oil companies are very debt laden. So uh, they seem to prefer those models. We get, we, we pretty much almost always get that question. Like, do you offer, you know, like uh, a financed option on your stuff? Um, so yes, the more, absolutely, the more like, like even a few years ago, I don't think there was any option really, any credible option to go finance like a bunch of ASICs. Um, banks, you know, weren't really into it. Uh, it was mostly only only private markets seemed to to want to touch it. So uh, I think increasingly, yeah, that's going to help uh, call it a handhold and uh, ease uh, ease the industry into this uh, as as a self as self mining. So I'm hopeful that that continues because uh, yeah. we're sort of basing our business on it. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of the creative solutions, like borrowing the money in Bitcoin, for instance, um, you know, is like a, uh, you know, helps protect against the downside case for, you know, obviously if Bitcoin goes to the moon, like, you know, we're all sort of projecting here, um, you know, your debt goes up, but so does your revenue. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, there's, you know, what we would call right way risk, um, associated with that kind of structure, um, which I don't know, it, it, it creates interesting opportunities for, for producers to kind of, you know, be the equivalent of like borrowing a, a, a drilling capital budget in, you know, that's priced in oil. And, you know, you, all you have to do is like produce that amount of oil to, you know, sort of pay it back. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, kind of interesting structures out there these days. It seems, it seems like, I don't know what you've seen, Chase, like I, I'm seeing an increased trend and in, you know, I've been talking with Galaxy actually about possibly doing this, um, just like using the Bitcoin you mine as collateral to finance, um, to take to take a loan out against. Um, I, we haven't really done that much in the past, but it, now that it seems to be becoming more of a thing, like Galaxy's offering this, 
Uh, so we're talking with Amanda here about that. Uh, so we'll shill, shill Amanda's uh, Galaxy Services here for you guys. But uh, and there's other companies doing that kind of thing. And I, I seem to uh, I see it pop up more and more. Like miners seem to be uh, taking advantage of these services, and then they, the, you know, the commodity that they mine, the coin, they can then get a fiat loan against that um, as collateral, and then they continue their operation. And uh, I was just intrigued by, uh, well, Lynn, Lynn Alden is intriguing in general. She's got great points of view. And she was talking about this uh, just on Spaces the other day, uh, how uh, this seems to be an increasing trend. And she was sort of relating to how it might drive, um, well, I mean, m more miners hodling. You know, they're going to be less on the market. And she speculates that uh, perhaps uh, it's going to drive further uh price increases just due to uh, reduce supply on the market. So I find all that very fascinating. Of course, it's uh, it's also risky to do that and you got to manage that properly, but it's a really cool tool. And, you know, I, I know for, you know, when we started, no banks would touch us at all. Like, uh, Thanks, Steve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, but Chase, you're definitely right. Uh, the financialization is going to be a, a big topic. Uh, and it, uh, Steve, are you back? Can yeah. you hear us? Oh, did I cut out? I was talking. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you cut out. All right, well, I'll just uh, that's it. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you, you guys are definitely right. And financialization is, is, a, is a good topic. And at Galaxy, we are. We are fans of the hash rate as an asset class, right? Um, uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, Amanda, I think we 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 are approaching the the limit. Uh, thank you guys so much for for answering my questions, and I was really happy to to talk to you guys. Moderator Gigi, great job. I'll still thank refer you to you as that for the at the for the rest of the day. Chase, Steve, and Marty, I think we lost him in the tunnel, but um, thank you guys so much for coming and telling your, your side of the story and explaining off-grid mining to us or non-rival mining or whatever we're gonna call it in the future. Um, really appreciate your time. Tomorrow we will have a Twitter Spaces at 9 a.m. again. I'm sorry, don't hate me. GG's 9 a.m. Pacific, right? 9 a.m. Pacific? <laughs> Gigi's in France. Um, and we also have another person in Liverpool and another person in China on our intern team. So I think I think we should make the intern suffer. And yeah. not the, not Chase, the Chase is in San Francisco. So. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can debate this later on our, our chat. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for um, for coming, and we will see you all tomorrow. Thanks for organizing, Amanda. Yeah, appreciate you having us on here. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, guys. See you guys. Yeah.